Hi, I'm Sasha Ryan. I'm an education reporter for 101.9 WDET, which is Detroit's NPR station. I will be moderating the discussion today. Thank you so much for joining us and watching the film. We have two panels. In a bit, we're going to get into how local schools and students are approaching college access questions right now. But first, we have Christine Rodriguez and Enoch Jamak from the film here with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We first want to catch up on what life is like after the film. What have you been up to, Christine? Hey, thank you for welcoming me. Um, my life after the film has been very interesting. Um, I recently graduated last May from the new school, Eugene Lang. I had the opportunity. Thank you. I had the opportunity to study abroad in Cuba for a semester. Um, and after graduating, I recently transitioned as a to a youth organizer in a local community organization that I was involved in throughout high school called Make the Road New York. So I've been um, in contact with a lot of young people and um, politicizing them and helping them organize to take action. That's amazing, thank you. Enoch, what, what have you been up to? Um, I have been in school. I transferred from SUNY Cortland to Queens College. Uh, I stopped playing football, started running some track. I'm trying to graduate. It's my senior year right now. I'm studying media production, and I have also been working very closely with Caroline, Christine, and Julie with um, making this new impact campaign that we've come about. I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain it to you, if you don't mind. Um, Please do. Okay, totally. Um, so originally, our impact campaign that we had was to inspire as many students as possible, right? We would screen the film and we would see immediate reactions from viewers and they would be like, oh my goodness, I'm totally motivated and inspired to persist more now. I'm going to get past this adversity because of your guys' stories. And we're like, this is amazing, right? So we're like, we have to get the film to as many schools as possible. And then we stumble across this research done by David Yeager and Greg Walton. And this research shows that if a student hears a story and then shares a story um, knowing that they're gonna help others and that another student hears that story about a time another student struggled, the chances of both students succeeding increases exponentially. So like if you hear a story about a time someone struggled and you share your own story about a time you struggled, the likelihood of both of those parties succeeding increases, right? And we're like, this is amazing research, right? So we revamped our entire campaign and now what we're, what, what we're encouraging students to do is to go onto their social media sites, share a story about a time they question whether they belonged in college, hashtag we belong in college. And thanks to the Gates Foundation, we're capable of giving $1,000 scholarships away to students anywhere on, in the world, right? And we're giving $30,000 scholarships away. So 30 students are have a potential to win a $1,000 scholarship, right? And, and you know, it makes me happy. It makes me super excited. And um, we are also giving away uh, 1,500 free copies of the film personal statement alongside a free curriculum for classrooms to hold and push out and engage with the film and the campaign. And it will be great if we can show a promo reel of our campaign and so you can get a full sense of what we got going here. Hello. Hi, everyone. What's up, everybody? This is my We Belong in College story. I remember my guidance counselor looking at that list and then looking at me and saying, I don't think you should apply to college at all. I couldn't reach my mother. She wouldn't give me those documents. If applying is so hard, right, what happens when I get there? I'm not even smart enough. I ended up not having where to live for two months. I didn't know where I fit in. I questioned whether or not I belong. But then I realized that my friends were struggling too. I didn't have enough preparation. The system jacked up, not me. I went to her office, uh, we hugged, we cried. I've never been more proud of my decision to just keep on persisting. We do belong in college. I belong in college. I belong in college. I belong in college. I belong in college. We all belong in college. <laughs> Wow, thank you for sharing that. 
you know, just looking at the film, you can see with just the three of you, really, how many stories there are about how to access college, how to talk to family, how to access money, all of those things. And then now we actually have the complications of students trying to go through these processes through quarantine, they can't even visit people mm -hmm. who might have that information, can't visit campuses. There's a lot going on. So I wonder if you two, and I'll start again with Christine, can talk a little bit about um, your what you know about what students need right now, what kinds of supports students need in this environment. Yes, so in my position as a youth organizer, I have been in contact with a lot of high schoolers and even college students. And I've been hearing common stories of like having stress because of being quarantined and not really being in, in this situation before, not having space to, to actually focus on doing their work and needing support from their teachers, from their counselors and their guidance counselors. They haven't really had contact or one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers and um, me being available, I have been hearing like the actual stresses that students are going through um, and um, how they have been navigating um, being in, in the same space with their parents. Some parents have lost their jobs. Some parents are sick. Some parents are going through financial problems and then having to also navigate schoolwork and having uh, this workload that is almost impossible to do in the, in the short time, sh short period of time that um, they're assigned to do it. So there hasn't really been much communication with teachers and counselors, with the students about like their capacity and what they need. And they have been very vocal on like how necessary that has been, or even just having a space to be listened and heard because a lot of people are really going through it and uh, mental health issues are are being skyrocketed. Like a lot of people are going through anxieties and not being able to sleep and stuff. So yeah, I, I like would recommend or like I, I would give the advice for any educators, teachers, counselors, if um, you have the capacity to or have a mechanism or something put in place to actually check in with young people, um, even if it's just once, a month or a week or something like that will be very, very helpful and, and can go a long way. Hmm. And like, I wonder how uh, running this campaign during the pandemic has, has looked too. What, what are you hearing in your work? Well, um, it's a great question. Since, since um, COVID-19 hit and, and like people starting to get quarantined and just since the pandemic occurred, uh, it it kind of took us off the rails for a little bit. But we are capable of adapting, and now we are offering students the opportunity to share their stories about how they're coping with this pandemic. And that story is completely a hundred percent eligible for our thousand dollar scholarship. Um, we've also turned our curriculum into. We've turned it. We turn, we adapted our curriculum to make sure it's capable for remote learning. And we're also providing online um, streaming copies of the film. So if those schools want those free copies and the curriculum, it's totally um, compatible for remote learning. And there will be streaming copies of copies available for anyone willing to use the curriculum and engage their students with the personal statement film and the We Belong College campaign. That's amazing. Um, and both of you uh, during this experience, what? how are you doing? How are you coping? Ooh, it is, it's <laughs> a, a guy. It's been gloomy over here, I'm not gonna lie. Mm. Um, but it, it was, I think, I think right now it's a big time for me and I feel like a lot of other individuals out there who are going through this pandemic to understand that reflecting on yourself is like one of the most healthiest things you can do. And that's what I'm trying to dedicate most of my time to instead of, I know people are like, you know, work out, learn a language, you know, I, I'm trying to do my work, but I'm like reflecting, like reflecting is my new hobby. And I'm learning so much about myself. And I think that's really, really important, especially for when this is over and you need to like step back into things and you need that motivation. So you like build up motivation now. So when it ends, you know, you just get this rocket start off. 
Great. Hey, Christine, how are you doing? Yeah, I agree with Enoch. Um, I, I've been I've been doing well. I've been taking this as an opportunity to do exactly what Enoch was saying, being introspective, looking inwards and working on the skills and the things that I needed to do to work on just as a person, just as my spirit and my health, um, being like um, more intentional about like the way that I spend my time and the things that I consume, the, the conversations that I have with my young people, navigating work and home and family matters and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, just like the fact that things are uncertain and things are changing every day with politics, with our realities and with our lives, it's just been very, um, a learning experience for all of us. Um, yeah. And I know we have a, a film from Carolyn, who's a, the third student featured in the film, really talking about her experience right now. Uh, why don't we kind of end with that? I'm grateful for my school who gave me the opportunity to stay here in my dorm room to prevent being exposed to the COVID-19 virus, but seven members of my family I've been really affected by this COVID-19 virus. My aunt even had to be hospitalized because of it. I feel extremely helpless being here while my family is at home. And on top of everything that I am dealing with emotionally and mentally, I also have to find a way to focus and learn how to maneuver my online classes. Please know that there's plenty, plenty of all the students out there struggling and dealing with the same situation that you are. And that by sharing our story, we can help each other cope with what's happening with this pandemic. I'm sending you a big hug. Please be strong, please be brave, and please, please stay safe. I think students, especially students in this college, are um, they're, they're a group we can kind of forget about as we deal with this. I'm really glad that um, Carolyn was able to share her story. Thank you, Christine and Enoch, so much for sharing your story with us. Um, like New York, Detroit has really been hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic, by COVID-19 cases and deaths, and the logistics of having a, a your community shut down, having to stay at home, not being able to go to class, having the organizations around you kind of scramble to do what they normally do, um, have created new challenges for students. So we put a panel together of people locally who are kind of on top of what schools are doing to uh, do their work and to respond to the needs of students. We have Vanessa Reynolds, who's an admissions counselor at Wayne State University. Joy Muhammad, who is at the University of Detroit Mercy, is a, a former high school counselor and currently a program director. And Eleanor Katolico, who's a reporter at Chalkbeat Detroit, who covers the Detroit Public Schools Community District. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Happy to be here. So let's, <clears throat> excuse me, let's get into the logistics a little bit. Let's see. The, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that high school seniors and even high school juniors are focused on transitioning into college right now. So what do things like grade point averages and, and high school applications, what do they look like right now? How are schools handling this transition? And I guess, why don't we start from the high school end, um, uh, Eleanor, and then look at how Wayne State and U of D and Mercy are handling the application process, the exception, the admissions process right now? Sure, so I can start. So when Governor Whitmer issued uh, her executive order to close schools for the rest of the year, she left it up to, to local school districts to determine um, their grading policies moving forward. So uh, within the Detroit Public Schools Community District, uh, the decision they have made is that uh, they will give out pass-fail grades for the second semester based on the grades that they had earned prior to the closures. So any student that had a D minus or above will get a passing grade and any student who had, you know, an F would get a fail in their transcript. But, you know, uh, the district is, is giving teachers some latitude to be able to, to promote students or, or past students uh, if they had felt that, you know, if classes were resuming, students had the chance to, you know, boost their grades, um, 
through that work, but also um, through their participation in online learning right now, they also have a chance to boost their grade too. Um, and for seniors specifically, uh, they will uh, be able to graduate if they're on track to the graduate prior to the closure. Um, and if they are short of credits, um, there are recovery classes that are going to be available for them to use. Um, they're still determining uh, in the district right now whether that's going to be in person or um, online, uh, depending upon you know the status of this public health crisis. But um, I think the reason that they wanted to to keep, do pass fails because they wanted to not have any you know penalized or detrimental effect because of what is happening right now on their transcripts. So that's what's looking that's what it's looking uh, right now within a DBSED. Mm -hmm. So Vanessa, how's Wayne State looking at high school students and their grades and this whole process right now? Great question. Uh, we are continuing to admit students, so seniors that are still interested in applying to Wayne State, we are still um, admitting them. And um, one news that I do have for um, students, seniors who did not have the opportunity to take the SAT or ACT previously, and we're planning to take it for the first time this spring. And obviously SAT has canceled their tests. And if they didn't register for the ACT, they probably will not be able to take it. So we are going test optional for those students. We will be doing a holistic review when we review those applicants. But I do want to uh, let students know that if you did not take the SAT or ACT, you can apply to Wayne State um, with test optional. And um, I did um, find out that for SAT, again, it's been canceled, but for ACT, there was supposed to be an April 4th test. It has been rescheduled for June 13th. So students who were previously registered for the test will be able to take it. And for Wayne State, we would definitely take those test scores once um, students complete the test. Okay. And uh, Joy, at the University of Detroit Mercy, is it similar processes? Are you also looking at um, alternative students? What's, what, what does it look like there? It is absolutely a similar process. What we're seeing is that is becoming the industry norm. We're going test optional. What we've really seen is a focus towards student guided admissions practices where we're really meeting the student where they are, right? So we're already, gonna, you know, we're going to continue our holistic review of every student to make sure that they are a good match for our university and that they meet the standard that we believe that they will be successful. But we're also taking in other um, considerations to, you know, maybe if they don't have that test score yet, we're looking at their personal statement. So if there ever was a time where that personal statement was going to really count, this is the year <laughs> that it's really going to count. Um, because we really need to know who you are despite the pandemic. We don't want this to define you. But we recognize that some students are really um, having defining moments as a part of this pandemic. For example, we have a huge dual enrollment program with schools like Detroit Crystal Ray, Melvindale High School, um, Detroit Public Schools, Renaissance High School, Cast Tech. We really are uplifting those students who have been held to the university standard because the university is still very much in session. Um, we have been making sure that those students have any type of technological issues that they need assistance with. We're meeting them halfway. We've extended uh, our deadlines for pass-fail selection on, those, on our college courses. And we've also extended our deadlines for withdrawing on those courses to make sure that we're not causing any of our high school students who we really value in the city any harm. Mm -hmm. Sasha, can I add something for the junior? Sure. So yeah. for juniors, at least for Wayne State, for our juniors class of 2021, we want you to know that we will not be looking into those fail and passing grades. We will be looking at your overall GPA um, and test scores and things like that. But do not worry. I want them to make sure they know that that's not going to count against them uh, moving forward. And so how does the situation affect money, the kinds of funding students can get, scholarships, the financial aid, application process. Are there changes and is this kind of rolling the way it has in other years? Um, for Wayne State University, we have already awarded our merit scholarships and also our access awards to our first generation low income students. However, due to the pandemic, we have made um, certain exceptions and certain deadlines have changed. Um, so for example, 
I'm not sure if everybody knows, but we have the Heart of Detroit tuition pledge available for any student that is currently attending a Detroit school or lives in the city of Detroit, which is a full, full tuition for four years. So students um, who qualify for that can still um, you know, submit their information if they have not. And our deadline has been extended for May 1st. Also, any student who is a member of the Midnight Golf Scholarship Program, we are still accepting applications for that. And that deadline has been extended for June 1st. And in addition to that, Detroit Promise Scholarships are still being awarded. We are also telling students that if their financial circumstances have changed, please contact our Office of Financial Aid so we can take a look at your information, your FAFSA. Um, our information will be provided towards the end. We will have our contact information so students who are in those situations can contact our financial aid office. We are still connected with our students. Our phone lines are still open. We are um, doing a lot of things in terms of uh, being available for our students. In admissions, we are doing virtual one-on-one -on -one appointments. So if students have questions about scholarships, financial aid, we can definitely connect them with the right person to make sure that those resources are still available for them. If there are any DACA or undocumented students, please contact us. We do have resources available through our office and also through the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies. And again, our information will be provided at the end. But if you feel comfortable, please contact me directly. I'll be more than happy to assist you. In addition to that, um, I would tell students, do not hesitate. If you have a question, if you don't know, if you aren't sure, just reach out to us. We are available. At Detroit Mercy, we do our financial aid a little bit different. We like we have an insane alumni base that is extremely generous and extremely well known in the city. So one thing that I love that we do is we like to pair our students with scholarships. So students do get merit based scholarships when they apply to the university. And in addition to that, we also have private scholarships. So specifically in the College of Engineering and Science, any minority students that are really looking to go into STEM, like I said, everything is really shifted to being focused towards the students needs. So we're doing interviews in person to match these students with the scholarships that we've been doing Zoom interviews. I, I've done FaceTime calls <laughs> with students to really make sure that they're matched to the um, to what they need. Anybody who is um, who uh, was previously held to the May 1st admissions deadline that we, you know, that we usually have, um, which was decision day across the state, we've moved that to June 1st. So that, you know, to give students enough time to not only recover financially from this, if, you know, but we're also here. If, you know, if the if the deposit is, you know, keeping you from enrolling, that we, there, there's no barrier that we won't transcend um, to in enroll the student. And like I said, specifically in college of engineering science, we're really looking to um, increase our number of minority engineers and scientists. We have an amazing program called the Rebuild Program, uh, which, and actually this program is at Wayne State too, Vanessa. <laughs> The Rebuild Program, yep. um, which is an amazing uh, opportunity to get students involved in STEM, give them research opportunities that they're doing medical, biomedical research in the undergrad. All of the deadlines have been shifted to meet the need of the students. So if, like she said, if you haven't reached out to your admissions counselor at Detroit Mercy, now's the time. We're here. We're still working. This is my home office. I'm still working. <laughs> um, so, you know, any phone call that you make will be, you know, will be answered. Any email will be returned. And I do want to add that although you're hearing this about Wayne State and U of D Mercy, other universities are doing similar things uh, like the decision day deadline, for example. I've spoken with a few of my colleagues and like Wayne State and U of D, many of them have changed their decision day from May 1st to June 1st. And I want to, oh, sorry, I wanted to know what Vanessa said about our undocumented students. For, we are still here to support you. Um, so if they're, like I said, don't let anything be a hurdle for you to reach out to the university. Do you have some sense for how the federal financial aid application process may have been a changed, adjusted, postponed? Do, what do we know about that? So... Uh, Hi. So I did reach out to the uh, Federal Education Department and they said that uh, applications are uh, still due for the federal deadline by, by June 30th this year for the upcoming school year. Um, and they had said, you know, it, it, it's variable by state and by school. If they had extended 
uh, their, their state loan deadline. So there are some states that had extended their deadline. So for instance, Kansas, Delaware, uh, and West Virginia are some states that have extended their deadline, but they're directing students to reach out to financial aid offices uh, directly to get more information. Um, what they did say though, was if you had already submitted your um, FAFSA application, you cannot change your income status at the moment. Mm -hmm. So if there had issues that have come up, if the family situation has changed where, um, you know, economic challenges are now um, uh, creating challenges for students, they are directing uh, students to take advantage of the financial aid uh, office resources available to them. Thank you for that. So if you aren't able to, oh, if you aren't, if you aren't able to change mm -hmm. it at the federal level, you can get resubmit information to our financial aid office. I think you can do the same thing at Wayne State, right? Right. Right. So there we have supplemental forms that you can fill out and say, you know, in, to let us know about any loss of income so that we can reevaluate your need. Yes, yeah, students need to be aware that uh, we are working with students. We are being flexible. Um, we, we, we're, not, we're not sure depending on their situation, but please reach out to us. We are available. Our financial aid officers are available to speak with students if need be. So just know that we're here. So we've got film festivals moving online, schools moving online. A lot of students uh, in Detroit, we know, don't have either consistent access to the internet or devices that are reliable for uh, education, for, for work. These would also be devices that we assume they would rely on for um, admissions to college. And if they got into college, uh, perhaps using college, I don't know what you can tell us about how your institutions are, are shifting to e-learning, but I wonder what you, what the discussions around the technology gap, the access gap, what that looks like, both from an admissions end and a, an education end right now, what, what are we concerned about? So I can start um, from the high school end of it. So uh, the school districts across the state are accelerating or their distance learning plans are underway during the time of school closures. And um, what is happening and what we're seeing is that the inequities that school districts that serve low-income populations are experiencing are being exacerbated now due to COVID-19. So, you know, school districts are required to provide other ways to provide learning opportunities to students outside of just online learning. So that could be in the form of academic paper packets. We see in DPSAD, they are offering academic paper packets for pickup at their 19 meal distribution locations, as well as 31 additional school buildings. Um, and they're also having teachers doing check-ins through the phone or texting through the phone. I spoke with a teacher just the other day that they just texted a student checking in on how they're doing on their assignments. So, you know, school districts are having to innovate other ways to connect to students outside of online learning. Um, within the Detroit Public Schools Community District, uh, the district superintendent, Nikolai Vidi, estimates they're about 10 to 20 percent of students that do not have access to a device or they do not have access to Internet or both. So, um, and that's out of 51,000 students within the school district. But this morning, actually, during a press conference, they had announced a partnership with local business and philanthropic uh, organizations to provide uh, tablets and Wi-Fi access to all 51,000 um, school district students uh, beginning in June. So that will enable them to participate in online learning opportunities um, throughout the, the shutdown, but also for uh, summer e-learning opportunities. And possibly, you know, depending on the status of the public health crisis situation in the fall, you know, blended learning opportunities will be available uh, for the Detroit district um, if that situation arises. Um, so yeah, I think there is some movement to, to addressing the digital divide gap because of uh, COVID-19. Um, and then there's also an effort to address the the needs of the other students in the Detroit in within Detroit that do not attend DPSCD. So there are about thirty six thousand students who may attend charter schools, and they're working on um, providing them access as well. Thank you for that. And what about um, U of D Mercy? Let me start. What does that look like in terms of how you expect, or what kinds of accommodations are being made um, for kids who might not have access to? So. Digital 
that, I mean, it's two layered. So first, you know, we have our students on campus, right, who are still on campus. We have a significant amount of international students, um, which is pretty typical for a university. So we've allowed those students to remain on campus um, within, you know, the governor's order that, you know, the shelter in place, we've kept our dining halls open. Um, and of course, you know, our campus is open as it possibly can be, given that, you know, we've had to shut down the recreation center and different things and all the food is takeout. So, um, but as far as the high school students we've served, like I said, we've extended those drop deadlines. We've extended the, uh, we've allowed them the option to go pass fail because the, the dual enrollment, as you know, you know, you have your high school credit and then you have your college credit. And we, we just really didn't think that it was fair to these students that, maybe would have transitioned into um, not having a computer or not having internet access, specifically students in the iDraw program, which is meant to um, serve underserved students, make sure that they have access, access to computer science principles and foundational courses. Um, we want, we've been doing everything we can to make sure that those students are being successful in terms of working with the school districts. We actually don't work with DPSCD and the iDraw program specifically, but we um, have found that Cesar Chavez High School and Melvindale High School, who we do work with and does serve these types of populations, have been extremely responsive in getting students tablets, laptops, hotspots, or whatever that it is that they need. I've made personal calls myself to make sure that these students have everything that they need in the course to be successful. The professor is Dr. Lapatina, who teaches the computer science principles course, also extremely um, interactive and working with the kids to make sure that we have everything. And so far we've seen about 80% of our students remain in the course and, and are doing very well and set to take the AP computer science exam, which is still going forward. So, you know, we've seen a lot of really good combination work between the university and the community and making sure that students are staying successful. Can I have one thing? Sure. So yeah, I think also beyond just learning too, uh, what I've heard from students and teachers and parents is that, you know, they want to maintain those connections within their school communities during this time. I think they're missing everybody. They're missing the routine and they're missing seeing the faces, you know, of those trusted adults, of those trusted peers every day. Um, and I had talked to I miss my Yeah. Well, I, I miss them a lot. <laughs> I talked to her the other day and she was just so happy to see the faces of their students through teams. Um, so I think, you know, the opportunity to bridge the digital divide gap, it's not only just to continue learning, but also just to maintain those connections during a time where a lot of stress and anxiety is high, especially in the Detroit district where there, we have lost a lot of people within the school community to COVID-19. Mm, well, here's a heads up. I'd like to come back to that um, in the next question, <laughs> but mm -hmm. make sure I, I hear from Vanessa about how Wayne State is looking at the digital gap and, and the need for those kinds of tools. For current warriors, um, actually, we all went online and like U of D, we still have a few students staying on campus, but we have been connecting with our students. All of our academic advisors are connecting with them. They're scheduling virtual appointments. So that feedback has been fantastic. Uh, because again, you know, not being able to go and visit your academic advisor in person to get guidance about what classes to register for the following semester. So from what I'm hearing, that has been very, very successful. And uh, also students who did not have you know, laptops, uh, computers, we were able to provide them with the loaner. So that has been very, very beneficial as well. I know the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies had a few students who uh, were um, first generation Hispanic students who did not have also laptops or those um, available. They were able to connect them with uh, the resources to get a loaner as well. So in terms of our warriors, uh, we are assisting them in any way that we can to make sure that um, this transition is smoothly. And one additional thing that we've done for our warriors, students who were receiving merit scholarships, we will not take into consideration the current GPA that they will be getting because again, due to the pandemic and the uh, transition from in-person to online courses for, for this following fall, we, we will continue with our awards. So that's great news. That's one less thing they have to worry about given the circumstances. And in terms of the high school students, we are connecting with them in many, many different ways. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have one-on-one -on -one 
virtual appointments with, with us, admissions counselors. We are also connecting them with their academic advisors so they can schedule classes or they can get their classes ready for the fall. We are also, uh, we launched a new program. It is a new platform. It is called Wiser, which I think is fantastic. And for that particular program, every single admitted student was invited to join. As long as they join, they will be connected with not only admissions, financial aid, housing, orientation, Office of Multicultural Student Engagement, other learning communities across campus. And also our students are a part of it, our um, peer mentors. So they'll be able to ask questions. So this morning I had a student who was asking about changing their major. I changed my major. What do I do? Who do I contact? So if they're confused. They can reach out through, to us through Wiser or through our phone line or send us an email. And we have a lot of events coming up, a lot of virtual events. One of them is um, Admitted Student Day. We are also collaborating with MCAN for decision, a big decision day coming up as well. And uh, one thing that I do want to share with our juniors, there is a new pro, a new event coming up. I just found out the day today actually, and it is sponsored by DASM Group, which is the um, all of the state university admissions directors from the 15 public universities, they will be having, we will be having a virtual college fair. So due to the pandemic, a lot of all of the spring fairs were canceled as you all know, because of that we have, uh, let me share the dates with you. We are all set to go with May 5th, 6th and 7th. And the title of this event is called Promoting the Public's Virtual College Fair. So for our juniors, that is still available for you. We also have virtual campus visits for our juniors. Even seniors can take advantage of that. But for juniors, anyone who participate um, is eligible for our Race Me micro scholarship. Mm. Well, let me ask you this. Today, our Winston University and the University of Detroit Mercy planning to have physical classes in the fall is there some sense that we're leaning towards digital classes? Today? <laughs> Today. Well, so, I mean, and, and maybe the answer is, we don't know yet, but I'm yeah, wondering. That, yeah, we don't know yet. We don't have any. We, we hope to be back on campus. Yeah. Um, we are doing our best to, um, you know, on, on this side to assist our students and get them ready to be back on campus physically, but um, I did have a student who was concerned about housing. And um, so in terms of housing, that will be available for students if we, for some reason, do not go back. Some students will have the opportunity if they need or if they really have to stay on campus, that will be available for them. But the goal is hopefully, right, um, we go back. That's what we all want. But uh, in the event that we do not go back, uh, we are definitely getting things ready. Um, my professors are getting things ready for on online courses if 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 we have to, but hope let's be hopeful. At this time, the majority of our courses, those that can, have been moved to online for the spring summer semester, which is about to start in about eh, three or four weeks, depending on the college that you're in. Um, as you know, we also have, you know, one of two dental schools in the state of Michigan at Detroit Mercy, and you can't do virtual dentistry. So <laughs> that has been a huge um, challenge for that college to overcome. So, but at this day, no, there isn't any plan to not be in school in the fall. Hmm. I do wanna add that our spring summer was also moved to um, to online. I'm actually a student right now. I'm, I'm working on my doctor's degree in educational leadership and policy studies. So I do have a class that I will be starting pretty soon, my spring class. Oh. I wonder, um, and this isn't necessarily any of you, a focus for any of the three of you, uh, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of mental health support that are available both to existing students, but also uh, perhaps to incoming students. And maybe we'll start with Eleanor, can you talk a little bit about DPS, CDs, uh, social emotional health teams? Do you have some sense for how those are the plans with that? Well, I do know they do have plans in place um, to support students I, throughout their continuity of planet, but they do have set up a mental uh, health hotline for students to call in um, if they're feeling they just don't want to learn today just because, you know, there's a lot of stress, you know, within the home. Um, so I know that has been 
established and I can provide that resource later on today. And I think too, I think teachers are, are given the, are being encouraged to just check in with students too. They're the main point of, of contact between, you know, the district and the students. It's, it's really those teacher relationships that are um, being used to, to try to check in on where, you know, students are at right now. So I think it's about kind of just taking it, you know, one step at a time, one day at a time and seeing, you know, what makes sense to, to be accomplished day to day uh, throughout the lesson. Because, you know, the, 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 the schoolwork isn't being graded. It's just teachers are just providing feedback. They want to maintain learning, you know, maintain that um, activity uh, because they're, they're worried about learning loss going into the fall, not being in school for this long. Um, so I think, yes, there is a uh, district resources available on their website at DetroitK12.org. There is a hotline available um, that students can call, you know, if they're, you know, struggling with something. And then also to their teachers um, are the people that they can lean on at this time. Mm, at Detroit Mercy, we have a, um, a great counseling staff. We, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we also have a college of education that has a counseling clinic. I'm actually a graduate of Wayne State's College of of a uh, counseling clinic. So I'm very familiar with that one as well. Um, but what I what I love about what we've done at Detroit Mercy is that it's not just, you know, of course the counselors are available to you free of charge all the time, all year, virtual or in person, pandemic or not. What I've also seen is that we're seeing a whole lot of support. Um, we have a on-campus pantry called The Hive. When Governor Whitmer made her order that we could no longer be on campus in person, The Hive started mailing food to students, non parents wow. Yeah, I thought that was just an amazing service. Um, the law school, which I'm currently a student of, is also, you know, we're seeing a lot of support coming from my professors that I've never, that's just been unmatched, right? So I'm seeing at one hand as an administrator for the university, I know the structural things that are in place to support students or student support staff is there. They're open, they're willing to work there. However you need within, you know, safety and precautions, those, are, those resources are available to you. We're also going the extra mile, like I said, with the hive, but we also have these amazing professors. And because we're a small school with small class sizes, small numbers, what's amazing is that our professors already knew you. They already knew who you were. So, you know, for them to call, hey, Joy, how are you? How are you doing with those kids? All them kids, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and working and not, is everything I okay? you know, So they know that, you know, they knew that I was a parent, that I was a full-time employee before the pandemic ever happened. So their support is a little bit more directed. And in, in, my, in my opinion, quite frankly, it's more impactful. Hmm. And at Wayne State, uh, not to be redundant, but pretty much the same thing that U of D is doing. And I think that's that's probably very similar across ca across campus in terms of the services uh, that we have available for our students, our future students. CAPS, for example, at Wayne State for counseling and uni counseling, that's still available. It hasn't stopped. We are still doing that. We also have a lot of learning communities who continue to reach out to our students. Uh, we have a Warrior VIP program for our first generation students. So we continue to learn to reach out to them and assist them in any way that we can. So definitely that connection is still going. The food pantry as well, we are still delivering food for those that need it or they can come and get it if they need it. So that's still open as well. And also, go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't mean to, to, to forget this part, but certainly the counselors and the social workers within the school district are still working to connect with students as well and providing social and emotional support. So it's not all just on the teachers. You know, everybody within the school district is rallying together to, to provide that social and emotional support for the yeah. students. And I can attest to DPSCD's counselors because a lot of my colleagues are DPSCD counselors mm -hmm. and they're calling and FaceTiming and Zooming these mm -hmm. kids. I'm calling them talking about what's up. They don't have time for it. They're still <laughs> interacting with these students in an impactful way. So shout yeah. out to them if any of them are watching. Mm -hmm. I think that is it's just either if you're a high school student or a college student, as you can hear from what well, everything that we're saying, uh, the service is there. All you have to do is ask, and we will be more than happy to help you or direct you to the right person. Uh, we are here. We are in this together, and I'm sure we will get through. 
So we, there were so many things that came up in the film. Uh, we didn't really have time to kind of tackle them, but I, I wonder if each of you um, could, could briefly point to how, you know, what stood out to you in the film? What kind of was familiar, what you would, what's the, what jumped out at you in the film we just watched? I can start. <laughs> I myself, I am a first generation Latina student. I grew up in Southwest Detroit, went to Western International High School. So my district was very similar to some of um, the students' high schools. So when I watched the film the first time, I was able to connect. I was able to relate. Um, I was telling Christine on, on a side note, I'm like, your mom sounds like my mom. I'm, I'm telling her great news about something. She wants to know if I ate. Are you okay? Did you eat yet? So uh, that's something that I think is a cultural thing. Um, you know, and I actually wrote a paper about being a first generation Latina student and my not, not be able to connect with my parents in terms of like be able to, they don't identify with what I'm going through, but I know they care, right? So when they change the subject, that doesn't mean that they don't care. It just means that they're not used to that. Um, so I was able to relate with the film specifically because uh, one, I'm a first generation student and because I'm Latina. And as as you saw, Christine and uh, Caroline, they're both Latina. So I was able to relate uh, more, more because of that as well. Mm -hmm. Joy, as a former counselor, yeah. what's good for you? So I'm a school counselor. Woo, it took me back. It took me back. Um, so it was that those numbers are not exaggerated. Those, those I lived that, I walked that, I, you know, I still in a way do. Um, counseling, school counseling for me is is a career. It's a lifetime career, and there's many, many different facets of it. But um, one thing that I wish now I'm sitting here like, huh, I never engaged students as leaders in their college access work. It was it was me. There were other you know college access professionals in the building. They were all amazing women. But to think to that 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 social capital of sharing stories and giving stories and giving encouragement that comes from your peer, you can't. You can't create that. You can't learn that. You can't teach that. There's no course for that. So um, the CARA program that I've learned about through this um, through this film um, that's in New York City, uh, we need that nationwide. <laughs> we need that curriculum. We need that funding. Fund them. Let's do it. Whatever we have to do, sign the paperwork. Let's get it done, okay? Um, <laughs> let's get that work nationwide because the reality of the situation is the the having 600 700 students on a caseload on one person it's impossible it's the work is it, it the pressure is insurmountable and um so if anything that we can do to assist students to uplift students and assist counselors and uplift counselors also because we need counselors i'm here for that thank you so much eleanor what jumped out at you I think I just related, it just made me jump back to my own personal experience, um, going to college and trying to navigate my identity and, and figuring out what I am. So I think what just really stuck out to me and what compelled me was just how, just their strength of character um, and kind of being able to, to wade through the adversity, especially with, I think I was really moved to watch, you know, um, Caroline in that classroom telling, the other students, you know, she's proud to be a lesbian. She's proud to be who she is um, and, and advocating for that. I, I was really moved by that. Um, and I, I certainly didn't have that same level of, of confidence when I was that age. But I think it just shows you kind of how much, you know, young people, how attuned they are to the complexity of life and how just braver and stronger. I feel like every new generation is, is coming every, I feel like every new generation of kids, they're always getting stronger, smarter. Um, so I was really moved by that. Thank God. I better watch out for Gen Z. <laughs> watch out for Gen Z. They are coming. Kind of <laughs> now what are I know. I want to thank you all so much for joining us. We want to uh, uh, say again where we pulled you from and that people can get more information at Wayne State University's admissions office at the University of Detroit Mercy admissions office and Chalkbeat Detroit, detroit.chalkbeat.org is the address and you can also find Chalkbeat Detroit on social media. 
Thank you so very much for joining us. We're going to Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. Thank you. We're going to close um, with a, a short film that was created uh, to remind us uh, about this campaign where students can declare that they belong in college. It's such an important thing. We want to thank all of the audience for joining us. I want to thank the Free Film Festival for showing the film and having this discussion. So please do enjoy. There will be some resources that we make available through Free and through WDET. So please look out in the future for more information about accessing college and continuing this discussion. Enjoy. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 It's live. Our creation is live. The We Belong in College campaign is up and running. Here's the deal. You can join our movement by sharing your story about a time when you question whether you belong in college. All you have to do is share your story on social media using the We Belong in College hashtag. We created this campaign because we know that our stories can help millions of other students know that they're not alone. And if you share it with us on WeBelongInCollege.com, you have a chance to win a $1,000 scholarship. All you have to do is head to WeBelongInCollege.com. Join us, and together we'll let the world know that we, we belong, belong in college. college.